we started the seminars five years ago. It's working with seniors and seeing the need for more information. And it's been a great experience. And so as we've developed these seminars, we're really committed to the purpose of to educate, equip, and inspire seniors to make informed choices and empowered decisions regarding their lifestyle goals. Uh, and you'll see running throughout our seminars the common themes of being prepared, the importance of planning, engaging in your planning for the future, and maintaining control. Now today's seminar takes a little bit different twist in some ways, but is very valuable information I look forward to sharing with you. Um, before we move into the program itself, I want to uh, acknowledge our sponsors. Jeff is helping me today. Jeff Cramp works with me on marketing. And I want to highlight the sponsors who help make these seminars possible. And Jeff, if you could put that screen there. We will come up in just a minute. Okay. There we go. Great. Um, we appreciate Silver Key Benefits. Some of you are engaged in the coffee with uh, Silver Key Benefits earlier, a couple weeks ago. Really help us look at our insurance needs for long-term care. They can help you see where our gaps are. And remember that all of our sponsors, while we're all businesses, we're very committed to sharing information with seniors in education. So we always want to, when possible, uh, take advantage, use our sponsors, support them as time is appropriate. Traditions Health um, look, is a hospice program and some of us think hospice is only a very short time at the end of a loved one's life, but we know it can be much broader and we want to continue uh, people being aware of the, the resources through hospice. We'll be hearing from that group in one of our later seminars. Visiting Angels, many of you have taken advantage of the Visiting Angels for caregiving, whether it be short term or more long term, um, but we appreciate the support. Last month we had um, representatives from Visiting Angels, Stacey Scarborough was with us, and for people to be aware of the resources there. Of course, the Wesleyan, we're very familiar with their senior communities ranging from independent to assisted to skilled nursing and rehab, but in, diff in addition to they have home health, home care, hospice, so it's a wonderful a uh, group in town that people have really turned to for a lot of support. And my business is Seniors Living Smarter Services. The downsizing realtor, we help people plan and take a lot of the stress out of a relocation when you're sharing, uh, selling your home, often you move to independent or assisted living, the big blue when we're giving up home, or owner, home ownership. But we really work with people to bring in the resources to simplify and take the pressure off. So. If some of you see that in your future, we like to start planning early so people can see how we can simplify it. Uh, so we appreciate the support of our sponsors, and I know they enjoy when we were having regular seminars so they could interact with people. We all miss that interaction. But on the other hand, doing these as webinars has allowed people who were not able to come to some of the other seminars because of mobility issues or caregiving, they can now join us. So that, that's great that we've picked up some new people too. Um, in fact, let's take a poll. I want to thank people for being here, whether opening up our computers today, for some of us, that's a, I'm not quite sure how it's gonna work, but people are really hanging in there. And so we want you to be involved with us. We created a poll. And so you down at the bottom, and you should be able to click on one of these answers. How many Seniors Living Smarter seminars, seminars or webinars have you attended? Good, we've got people filling it out. If it's your first webinar, if you've been to two or four seminars, probably five to 10, yeah. 15 to 20, or more than 20. Um, if you've had perfect attendance over all the years, this is seminar 47. Um, so, but I know we've got a lot of regular attendees. In fact, as we're doing this, I can see at our seminars when we were at First Presbyterian, there on the right would be Catherine Rice and Ann Gowdy and Cheryl Wills moving on back. We would see the Strayers at the back going across. We would see um, Linda and Scott Lansing. We would see Bev Holland. So it's kind of fun now, I see names. 
But if you look and see, we have a lot of people been with us for a number of seminars. We do the seminars monthly, 11 months a year. We skip December, um, but yay. So we welcome our new people. We had seven people new with us today. And then we do have a whole group ranging on up to uh, five people who have uh, been to 20 or more, and probably some of the others at 15 to 20 have been to more too. Anyway, it was fun to see see who's with us today, and we're glad to have you here. All right, so we can take the poll down now. Um, let me explain the format too. Okay, here we go. So we follow a similar format to what we do with our seminars. We will have our presenters uh, share. We have prepared questions that we will go through. And then we will open it up for um, questions from the floor. You will see at the bottom of your screen where participant polls, share screen, and yours, you may just see. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. No? Okay. If you. You should be able to raise your hand. I think on your screens, you'll see an opportunity to raise your hand. And then we will see that and we will call on you. I'm hoping that that's up that way. I think it is. So, okay. All right, so we'll come back to that. We'll, answer, we'll take the questions at the end. Um, so we're ready to move into our program today. The idea for this program really was generated by Bev Staley, who works with me on the seminars. And she was saying, I think this is a really important topic. And it was definitely echoed you know, back in October and November when we had a group of regular seminar attendees who helped plan the seminars for this year. Uh, and there was a discussion about our own physical safety, about scams. So we've put this program together becoming more aware of the threats around you will keep you safer. And it's really been highlighted this year with some incidents that have occurred. We kind of take things for granted that we live in this little perfect sleepy community, but when things have happened, it maybe made us need for us to be more aware. And that's why I'm thrilled that we have with us today, uh, officers Bert Witcher and Delta Jolly from the Georgetown Police Department. Uh, community engagement unit. So I'm going to ask Bert and Delta to introduce themselves and then we'll move on into our questions. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm Officer Delta Jolly with the Georgetown Police Department. I've been here for a total of eight years, um, half on patrol and also half here in the community engagement unit. Um, I also have eight years of previous dispatch experience, so I had a lot of uh, foresight into knowing what I was getting into. Um, basically, the community engagement unit is a bridge between the police department and the community. It basically um, helps to form those bonds and maintain those bonds that have been built through police interactions, but to make sure it's almost the, if you want to call it the more gentler side of policing, um, and we're able to give a lot of information and be able to have information sessions such as these uh, webinars with uh, Virginia so that we can transmit more information out to the community uh, more than and, and you get more time with us more than you would do with the regular patrol officer. Um, our unit also comp is compromised of the school resource officers, um, which is a very important bridge in the community with our school system. Um, we also do programs such as Blue Santa, National Night Out, uh, Police Explorers, um, Law Enforcement Field Day, and uh, Chase the Chief, which are just to name a few. We actually have uh, tons of activities. Um, we make sure that we do events and we partner with businesses and community centers like Wolf Ranch in order to help build, um, help build those relationships. We currently, with the COVID uh, pandemic, we're currently doing a lot of birthday parades, celebration of life parades, Zoom meetings such as these, and we, we 
are coordinating activities and tasks that are normally done by our police volunteers between our unit and our school resource officers. So that's basically what we're doing right now and me in a nutshell. Okay, thank you, Delta. And thank you, Virginia, for uh, putting this together and organizing it and thank you to the sponsors. I'm Bert Witcher. Uh, I'm uh, a Lieutenant in the unit. And so kind of echoing what Delta said, uh, we're trying to establish relationships, support existing relationships, and we try to kind of take a focus on different segments in the community. So uh, obviously this is a, a particular uh, time with the pandemic and all when uh, reaching out to our seniors who may not be able to be in the community very much is, is really important. So I'm glad we're able to share this time together. Uh, as far as history on me, I've been here in Georgetown with the PD for 22 years. I've spent time in patrol uh, as an officer, a sergeant, and a lieutenant, and I, I spent uh, approximately eight or nine years in criminal investigations, doing both general crimes where I, I worked with victims of theft and scams and also did some time uh, working and narcotics and, and vice activities, which kind of related to it. So uh, one of the important things I do is, is work very closely with the school officers in uh, trying to uh, develop programs in the school. So we're, we're glad to be here today. And Bert doesn't know I'm gonna say this, but I'm gonna throw another little twist or something in here. Um, as many of you who attend our seminars know, we often talk about senior communities and being aware of independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, rehab, and so on. And over the, what's been going on in our country, there's often been a lot of misunderstanding when people think all these senior communities and this outbreak of COVID and how horrible it is. We have to remember there are the different levels of communities, independent, where people are very engaged. Right now, a lot of them are in their communities and staying put assisted living when you need more assistance into skilled nursing where there really are health challenges going on. That's where we've seen the number of cases uh, is more in that. So I just always want to put a plug in. That's a different unit. The reason I mentioned Bert is we have a special guest with us today. I just checked to make sure his mom is watching. He asked me a while ago, it's not too much trouble can my mom watch. She is in an independent living community in Bertram. And, and hers is a neat one, it sounds like, where that she has her own cottage there. And so, you know, we always look at knowing what's available. So uh, we may have to uh, get more information from Marie about her cottage at Wildflower Meadow, I believe it is. Yes. And so, and Bert. And, and Bert was just really saying how outstanding the care has been there during this time not going to the common meals now, but they may do me, uh, one meal a day delivery and just really are taking good care of their residents. And we see that so true in our, our community. So we always want people to have accurate information about that. Well, let's go ahead and, um, you know, unfortunately in the last year or so, there've been some incidents, which I mentioned earlier, that have really caused us to be aware that we do need to be more aware of our surroundings and personal safety. And so uh, Delta, would you start us off by sharing some recommendations uh, how we can keep ourselves safe? Sure, um, so my recommendations are that although it seems that there have been more discussion about crimes that threaten our safety, we're actually blessed to live in the, the third most safest city uh, in Texas that is our size, okay? So basically what I'll do, I'll go over seven ways that we can improve our situational awareness. And this is a very general um, list that's by no means exhaustive or um, rules to follow, but just merely suggestions that you can add to your regular day and your regular routine, just to make sure that um, you are kind of more cognizant about the things that we do. Um, and I will tell you right now, I, I have to put some of these things into practice as myself, not just as a police officer, but because there are times that I go out with my daughter or my mom. And so not to be hyper vigilant, but I make sure that I'm a little bit more aware of my surroundings when it, rather than when it's just myself. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is identifying objects around you. 
So improving your situational awareness starts with being more mindful about your surroundings. So even though you, you have a habit of going to your car, you kind of go to, go to your car, you get in your car, you start your car, it's kind of habit, it's routine. You go to your garage or it's out in, the, uh, in your driveway, but you kind of really don't think about it. It's almost like getting up and breathing, right? You don't have to think about breathing. When you have to go somewhere, you just walk out the door, you lock your house, you get in the car and you take off. Well, what we want to do is make sure that we take a second before we walk out of the door, identify if there's anything in your environment that's out of place. Um, so many times there will get calls for burglaries and it's after the fact, right? So, or let's say um, porch pirates are my favorite right now. So <laughs> let's say that you walk out of your house, you're going to the grocery store, just routine. You don't notice it because you're on a mission, okay? So you come back from the grocery store and you realize that there should have been a package by your door. Go back, let's say you have a ring camera or some sort of uh, home system and you see that it was delivered already. Uh, prior to you, you leaving and you just didn't notice it. Well, part of the things that we sh need to start doing, and even though I live in an apartment, let's just, so that everybody's aware, I live in an apartment, so I don't have a house that I can check behind shrubbery and stuff like that for, yeah. but you want to make sure that when you exit your front door, that you're kind of aware of what's going on. You know, if you see your friend, your neighbor, or somebody jogging down the street, you know, wave hi, all that good stuff, you know, still be normal don't you know get robotic with it but you kind of want to make sure that you're aware of what's happening your trash cans dumped over or something like that something just not out of the normal or is odd okay so we also want to make sure that you're um keeping keeping your eyes on your normal things and when i say normal things your car your purse your wallet your keys um I actually had a habit of uh, leaving my key in the door because my daughter was always coming in behind me and she would always take it out. Well, one day she didn't and I never thought of it. My key set in the lock of my door of my apartment um, until I decided to leave out later on that evening. So that, <laughs> that could have been a bad day for me. Right. Uh, but just making sure you're identifying those things, you know, don't become complacent and our day-to-day -day activities. Notice other people. Like I said, you come out and you see your neighbor. You notice that you're, them jogging. And I might add, notice what's unusual for your neighbor. If, if we've lived next to each other for a, a good amount of time, I should know something about your habits next door and develop those relationships where I'm, I'm not being that nosy neighbor. It's just we're watching out for each other. So. Right, and so, when you're noticing other people and you're noticing your neighbor, let's say, oh no, there's like their mail starting to stack up um, at, their, at their mailbox. Or they've got several new, several days of newspapers in their driveway. You know, those are clues. We're not just talking about safety, personal safety. We're talking about the safety of our community at this point in time. And so if you notice your neighbor's got tons of uh, newspaper, you know, go over there, knock on the door, check on your neighbor because they may have fallen. You know, it doesn't always have to be something uh, super tragic, but they may have just fallen and are, and are unable to get to a phone. So we want to make sure that we're checking on those things, things that just might seem unusual for yourself, for your neighbor, or for the neighborhood. Um, so cars, um, especially at night, uh, if you notice a car that's just out of place or you're not used to it, uh, even if it's a couple, you know, a couple houses down from you, you know, and it's okay if you have that neighbor's Phone number, call up. Hey, you got somebody visiting. There's a weird car that I haven't seen before that's parked outside your house. You know, and we have a tendency like, oh my gosh, you're so nosy. Well, this day and age, we have to be nosy. Um, we have to take care of each other. We, you know, kind of that old adage, we are our brother's keeper, you sure. know. And so uh, teamwork makes a dream work. And working together as a community doesn't just stop at your front door. We, we had, uh, I, I worked a case a few years ago that we had that very thing happen. It was someone who came home for lunch from work and they ate their lunch and what did they do? Uh, 45, 50 minutes after they arrived, they left. Well, it turns out the bad guys were parked down the street. They watched them pull in their driveway, realized they were in the house for 40 some odd minutes at 12 noon and then watched them drive off. So they go, they broke into the house. Uh, turned out that the husband was a day sleeper uh, who worked nights, so that was a surprise to them. But when we started canvassing the neighborhood and talking to the different neighbors, 
we ran across the neighbor and said, yeah, I saw a car setting out uh, on the street with two guys in it that was running and it sat there, I, I know at least for an hour. I'd never seen the car before and I'd never seen the guys before. But it truly never thought to, uh, the thought never occurred to her, hey, that's something out of place suspicious that, that could be a threat to our neighborhood. Never crossed her mind. It was out of place, but not out of place where she saw it as a threat. So we're just uh, wanting to be aware of those things. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback on that, that's not to say to call us every time there's an out-of-place vehicle, you know. We also want to um, empower you, so to speak, to, I don't know, for lack of a better word, do like a mini investigation, you know, call your neighbor, hey, is this vehicle supposed to be, do they belong to you, do we know where this car came from? Um, sometimes it might just be a car that broke down and they had to come get a, you know, an Uber or something else to come pick them up until they could get a tow truck out there. Um, but in, in the deeper neighborhoods, you know, most of those cars that are broken down are going to be further on the outskirts of your neighborhoods, not necessarily deep inside the neighborhood. Like it, there's something deep inside of Sun City. There's usually a, a lot of questions happening um, or even in Heritage Oaks, you kind of have to me meander and so through some of those um, streets. So just making sure that you're you're cognizant of what's happening. And you guys know your neighborhoods better than we do. You guys know what cars belong there, what people belong there, um, and usually friends, uh, regularly visiting friends and family members. Yeah, you may notice a car that there's no one in it and it's parked there and you're like, I've never seen that car before. It doesn't seem to be parked directly in front of someone's house. So it may be unusual to you. So maybe the most appropriate thing to do is if you are in a position where you can see the license plate, copy down that it's a white Ford Taurus with this license plate. And that may be fine. That way if something does happen, uh, then there's there's a little bit of a investigative lead for us. And that may be different than a car sitting there for 45 minutes with two guys sitting in it who you've never seen before and they're just sitting there, so. Yes, so, um, and also, like we said earlier, you'll get a handout with all of these things. Um, I'm gonna skip down um, past a, a few of these. So if you, if you don't get all seven, I'm going to talk about them, but I'm not going to get too far in depth. Okay. Um, so number three um, would be identify entry and exit points. Now this should be a, a duh moment for us because we know where our entry and exit points are in our house, our front door, back door, and things like that. But when we're in crisis or something's happening, sometimes we forget that our homes have windows. So <laughs> When, if something is occurring in your home and you want to make, if you're wanting to escape a situation, make sure that you remember that you have windows. I know that seems like, why does she have to say that? But most of the time in our heads, just as human beings, we think of doors as entry and exit points. We never really think of windows um, or anything like that. So just remember your garage doors, your side exit doors, things like that, patio doors, sliding doors. Um, but remember that you have windows in your home. And when you're out in the public, this is one of the things, you know, a sad part of our uh, uh, culture is that things happen out in public with the active shooters and all that, that we hear so much about. So if you're in Walmart or any big box or any store, we want you to just be aware of where is that back exit? You know, usually all these commercial stores, they have an area where maybe there's restrooms in the back and there's storage and usually a back door is going to be there. But do you know where that is? How far am I from that uh, in the aisle I'm in? You know, so we just ask you be, be cognizant of those kinds of things. All right. And um, also, when, if you're in a dangerous circumstances, you also want to make sure that you disengage. Okay. I'm not going to tell anybody that they're not allowed to fight somebody off. Okay, you you are you need to be comfortable with your own level of um, skill. Okay, um, what's best is you can disengage, get away, run away. Um, I would suggest do that rather than trying to engage one on one because you don't know what the skill level of the other person is. Okay. So make sure you can withdraw from a dangerous situation and avoid engaging with the attacker. Uh, it reminds me, I had a converse, I did a different uh, HOA uh, meeting similar to this 
and the one of the people asked me if it happened in Walmart, and I use Walmart just because a I'm there all the time, but it's 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 a recognizable place. But let's even say you're in Target, right? And somebody um, is in there with the with the weapon, right? Well, the guy said, "Well, what if I just turn and shoot the bad guy?" And I said, "Well, when police show up, they're gonna think you're a bad guy because all we have is a report of a man with a gun." So we don't, as police officers, we don't wake up in the morning and think, hey, we're probably going to shoot somebody today. You know, we don't do that. We, our goal is when we wake up is to go to work and then come home the same way we left the house. And so what I always recommend, and I understand that, you know, there are people who want to protect their community just as much as we do. But in that same token, we don't want to show up on scene and end up injuring somebody who was trying to help. So if you can disengage, disengage, never engage an attacker, okay? So then we'll move on to number four, um, practice prediction. So no, you can't predict the future, okay? But people are creatures of habit, right? So, you know, when you go home, you always, you might always leave your, um, you're unloading groceries, you might always leave your uh, passenger doors open while you're unloading your groceries, okay? so. People usually predict that sort of behavior. Not everybody, you know, closes the trunk and goes in the house and then comes back and opens the trunk and then closes it. And that's tip that's not a typical routine when you're unloading groceries. So if you can practice prediction, you can also practice being unpredictable. Okay. If you I don't drive the same way to work, even though it's I always have to jump on Williams Drive at some point in time. I don't always take the same way out of my apartment complex, okay? I've got two points in, I got an option. Sometimes I take a lap around the apartment complex and do a drive through just to make sure, you know, there's nothing out of place. Um, but you can always practice being unpredictable just as much as you can practice uh, routines and habits. You know, one of the things we talk about in, in training officers even is scripting, the, the what ifs. So uh, we would encourage you that as you move through your day, through your week, uh, take those places that you routinely go to, your grocery store, your doctor's office, um, your place of worship. And when you're there, think about if I needed to, to disengage, if I needed to move away, what would I do? Where are the doors? I, I know uh, a lot of people don't think about it uh, when they're at their place of worship. Uh, but you've got, it's like an, uh, like being anywhere else crowded. There's a lot of people. And if everyone's going to start moving for the exit, they're probably going to move to the exit they came in. Uh, so be thinking about that and, and script in your mind, how you would react. And that prepares you ahead of time. Uh, as officers, as we roll up to uh, calls that we're responding to, we're continually thinking, what if, what if? That's not to advocate that we need to be paranoid. We don't want you to be paranoid. So right. it's a wonderful country that we live in. Um, we're so blessed, but it's about that preparedness. And if you think through it a few times and you've thought about it, then you're prepared for that day if something happens. Yeah. I just want it, to it, interject something real quickly too. Um, I know the church that we attend you always, you know, we're safe. Nothing's ever going to happen here because there have been those incidents, and, you know, unbeknownst to people. And so, and I've heard of, in our church, then periodically we've had those kinds of drills. Where would you go if, as you know, a, a sound was sound, something sounded that we needed to leave? And we're saying, oh, well, we don't need that. We don't need that. But it's been interesting as I've talked to more and more people at other churches, other places, yeah, we've been through that too because we are in a different world and, and just wanting to emphasize what you're saying, the importance of us to be thinking ahead. So we'll go ahead with your list and see what else we can learn. Yes. Yeah, so, um, and I was just going to, one more point on uh, number four, that it's just, it's really healthy to maintain a realistic mindset that you're not always safe, okay? Because complacency, even in the work environment, um, complacency does kill. Like, you know, when you get complacent in your work, then you don't want to work there anymore, right? So, so now you've killed your income, right? But we also, we just want to make sure that you just, we have to think that we're not in the same uh, world that we used to live in. And it's an unfortunate thing. However, 
if you get into the routine of knowing, okay, well, something may go bad today and you're aware and kind of cognizant of your surroundings, it, it, I'd rather that rather than walking with blinders on, okay? So then we have number five, um, staying vigilant, okay? So situational awareness requires constant vigilance of your circumstances to identify issues and eventually predict problems before they arise. So as we do with our children, we can tell when our children are lying, right? We can also talk, um, and on our police work side, it's called pre-attack indicators, okay? Well, I'm not expecting you all to know that. As um, lay people, so to speak, you know when something's about to happen. You see people get a little fidgety, they can't stand in one place, their voice starts to rise. So you know that you know either an argument is happening, you see this is about to happen. And as as humans, we can see like, you know, the this is happening, they're like getting really ready to go, they're clapping their hands, they're like, okay, and they're everything starts to go up a notch. Well, we know that a fight might break out. It may not happen, but there's a high potential for there to be a physical confrontation, okay? So we wanna make sure that you're listening to your environment, not just looking, okay? I know we talk about being aware, being aware is not just using one of your senses, it's actually using all of your senses, okay? So you don't wanna sacrifice your situational awareness um, and then become a target because you're not using all of your senses. Um, also trust yourself, which is number six. Um, trust yourself, trust your gut. Um, you have a gut feeling for a reason, okay? So you start learning to lean on those six senses, so to speak. Your you know, hairs on the back of your neck raise up in a particular situation, or you just don't feel quite comfortable. Um, trust that your, in, your internal reactions are key elements to pointing out danger that you may not be fully aware of. Yeah, it, just to uh, kind of echo what Delta said, uh, Trust your gut instinct. It, it's really uh, statistically pretty accurate. Um, when you see these studies where they talk to convicted felons, bank robbers, uh, people who attack police officers, they all talk about they were scared. Their adrenaline is high. So that's all the things that are recognizable to us on a routine basis. So you do have those pre-attack indicators that are just gut instinct that we all recognize. So great, good, good stuff. And on the final talking point, um, now, again, I know we're talking about seniors living smarter. However, I know there's some of you seniors out there that might be a little bit more agile than I am sometimes. So you want to make sure, and this one's kind of a fun one, you practice your situational fighting techniques, right? <laughs> so what I would suggest, um, especially if you're, you're, mobile, you're still out there, you're getting around, moving around, walking and stuff like that. My mom uh, walks with the cane. And so occasionally she'll work on her batting techniques. Okay. So <laughs> you always want to make sure that you train your mind to, um, to be able to confront a situation if it does present itself. Okay. So you want to be able to protect yourself and you also want to train your body in order to ensure that you're able to withstand that attack. Now I'm not saying to have somebody sit there and do some um, karate kid type stuff where, you know, some, you're beating up a tree. I'm not talking about that sort of training, but if you are, if you are inclined to do so, take some self-defense classes, um, take some cardio kickboxing classes, um, anything that can help, um, with your dexterity and working on your, uh, situational awareness, your uh, surrounding environment, stuff like that. Uh, I practice with my daughter at home and she's 10 and I will scare the crap out of her. And it's, it's fun for me, but uh, I sit in the same place for a month and she came in the door uh, from school and she just went straight to her room every time. Well, our kitchen is at the end of our walkway <laughs> for our door. So I would scare her every time. And she finally got to the point where she looked around the corner before passing it, which is what I wanted her to learn. You know, so now it did take a month of scaring her um, which was probably a little bit traumatizing for, for her at her age, because um, this was a few years back, but it also helped her to know how she was going to react in a situation if somebody were to jump, you know, to um, present themselves in such a way from around a corner. 
you know, or just to kind of surprise her. So she kind of knows what she's going to do. And she's, she's taken three years of Taekwondo now. So she has a skill set there that she's able to, to rely upon if something were to happen. And another thing I'll add is when you hear from, uh, from some of these offenders, they'll talk about how they pick their targets and they want to pick a target that they visually recognize is going to be simple. So things like carrying yourself confidently, like it's a parking lot at night. We still want you to do those things like park as close to the door as you can. Park under a light, don't park under a dark place. But wherever you're at in that parking lot in the end, we want you to walk confidently yeah. across there. If you see something that your, your senses go, that's unusual, that's out of place, that's odd, uh, a person, make eye contact with them. That's yeah. one of the things they don't like. They actually want someone who they can tell just wants to get where they're going and, and, and those can, so make eye contact, walk confidently. Yeah. So walking yes. with your head down or in your phone, um, not paying attention. Those, those are yeah. typically our, our, our targets and mm -hmm. we want to make you less of a target. Um, so like I said, if, as long as you are, your head is up, you're paying attention to what you're doing. And like Bert says, um, you look confident there. There are very few, uh, attackers that are going to try to engage somebody who looks like, like they're about their business. And I had some, a lot of our businesses that close late at night, uh, but it, this would apply to other things too. If you observe a situation, maybe I'm fixing to walk out of my church. I'm, I'm volunteering at my church and it's 930 at night and I start to walk out and there's a car out in the parking lot that I've never seen before. That's just strange to me. Every police department you deal with is going to be fine. If you call that administrative number and say, hey, listen, I'm at this church and uh, there's a car out in the parking lot. I was getting ready to leave. And it's just, it, it, uh, I don't know who they are and it just makes me uncomfortable. Could you have an officer swing by here uh, so that I can leave? Well, we're going to send a car by there. And when that police car rolls up through there, they're probably going to circle by and check and say, hey, are y'all all right? Or, and they're going to find out the story. Well, that's my opportunity to walk out, get in my car and leave. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's nothing. Probably it's nothing, but it's just an opportunity. Bert, let me ask you a so, question. Uh, you made a point. Bert had mentioned about if you see that, to call the administrative number. That, is that different than 911? What number would you call when it's not a definite emergency, but a concern? What number do we call? Yes, so um, there's so there's two ways to get a hold of the police department. So there's the administrative number, also called the non-emergency number, which is 512-930-3510. And that'll give you a list of prompts. Yes, it might seem frustrating. You just hit one, you keep going, okay? And then of course you have 911. So That's while we're talking point. about that, um, so we have what's called smart 911. Uh, sure. If you're at home or you've got your phone um, registered, <clears throat> excuse me, with the service, basically what you can do, you can go on smart911.com, put in your address, and you can load as much or as little information um, about yourself, your property, your cars and everything that's at your house if we have to respond there um, for a call. Now, I will tell you this, Smart 911, only that information only loads for medical calls. Police officers don't get that information. So if there's a medical emergency at your residence, um, the fire department will get that Smart 911 information loaded into their computer as they're on their, on their way to that call. Also, um, we don't have access to that information just if we're looking at your address, we can't pull that up. That is only accessible when you call 911. Um, you can load um, medical information as much or as little as you want, uh, location of medications uh, in your household. If you have a list already, let's say you keep a list of medications on your freezer um, and then the location, okay, so here's my list and they're located in the bathroom uh, cabinet sink or the, ba the bathroom cabinet uh, that's over the sink. Or let's say you have, you know, Fluffy's on scene. You got a, a, a little uh, dog that's there that's, you know, that is prone to be scared and maybe take off running. But at least we, we have that information, you know, it's a, I don't know, a, a Pomeranian, you know, 
a type of dog and you know it's a brown pomeranian that might be there at the house okay or you can tell me if your doberman pincher is there <laughs> if i call him by his name he won't bite me so give me give me the doberman pincher's name <laughs> thanks um, for clarifying for, thanks for clarifying who has access to that information i know in earlier times yeah. i've heard discussions about smart 911 and some people were reluctant to so I don't want this just to be out for everybody to see, but you've clarified that it is a confidential secure site. And you're going, one of the things we will be sending in our follow-up email is about SMART 911, correct? Yes. Correct, we've got, a, uh, we've got a pamphlet that Virginia has access to, and she can forward that to you. It's got all the information about, I say it's a great website. One other thing, not every jurisdiction uh, subscribes access to it but one of the things you can do is load information about your car on there and I, I advise people it's a good idea because if you're traveling and you have a problem who knows in South Carolina uh, you may dial 911 and, because you've had a wreck and you may not be able to talk and they're gonna get that and they're gonna say hey I've got a 911 call from out on the interstate uh, I'm not hearing anything on the call but I've got Smart 911 and they list their car as a white uh, Chevrolet Caprice with Texas license plates of that. Well, now the highway patrolman has a vehicle to specifically go look for. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons I advocate listing your car in there as well. But again, you have the option, whatever you're comfortable with, that's what you can put. Let me ask, so I, um connect another point here when we talk about accessibility and information. I know that one of the pieces that we're going to make available or a couple pieces will be about knock boxes. Some people have knock boxes, some people have asked about it. Would you give us a quick explanation of what knock boxes are? Knock, knock or knock? Knocks. And knock. how they work. Okay. You let yes, so, yes, so the knock box, um, there's a home box and this, um, uh, information will be available um, through Virginia as well. Um, but basically it is a service uh, provided through the fire department here, through Georgetown Fire Department. They, you can purchase one separately offline on your own. They will require registration and then it will have to be keyed uh, to Georgetown Fire Department. However, it'll probably end up cheaper and they don't have to go through the rekeying process when you purchase the system through the fire department. But basically, it allows accessibility to your home if there's a medical call so that we don't they don't have to call us to have to breach your door. Uh, they don't have to use either a pry bar or a spreader to, to gain access to your home. Uh, it is located typically near your front door and each fire truck has a box with a key on that. However, it is secure. Why? because each member of the fire department has their own code to get inside that box and that logs who's accessed it and for which address, okay? So just in case, because uh, I wasn't familiar years ago with these, how these work is you put your house key inside that box. Yeah. That box is mounted to your wall and uh, we want to make sure it's securely mounted to the wall where it can be, can be pulled off. So the fire department has a single key that can open any box to get to your house key. And the way they keep that secure is on that fire truck, there's that electronic access so that anytime that key is accessed off the fire truck, they know exactly who picked up that key. So that key is always kept secure and not compromised. So even as a police officer, if we're responding to your house for a welfare check, and we noticed, uh, well, something's not right. We can contact the fire department and then they will respond with, um, if you have a Knox box, well, they'll respond in order to gain entry into your house so that we and don't that's have one of the, the property. One of the questions people have asked, I've, as a realtor, I worked with people who had Knox boxes on their house and when they were selling the house, they would say, do, do I need to take it off? Well, it was better to leave it on. To me, it, it's an advantage for the house. It became one of those features that's already there. And uh, so that's, it does say that prying your doors open and also another point that people might want to think about is we constantly talk about being educated, being prepared. That's a great way to do that. 
Um, let's move on to scams. Let's do a quick poll here. And you know, we've talked about our physical safety, but now, you know, there's also safety when it comes to email, phone, uh, online, and so on. So Jeff, you want to put up our poll that we were just going to see how many of us have been the targets of scams in, let's say, the last six months, either email solicitation, phone call. I gave examples uh, where representing themselves as IRS or Social Security. Uh, online hacking, any of you, what, have any of you been uh, targets for that? Okay. And I, my husband's with me today. I, I have to say, some of these phone calls are so good. I would recently been engaged with Social Security trying to get things set up in different way, whatever. And I got a call from Social Security. Well, the timing was amazing. I'm, I'm needing to talk with them, so I'm sure that's it. But it didn't quite sound right. My husband and I well, were both in the car, and he's looking at me like, it's a scam. But I just was afraid that was my one moment to get the information or give the information. Fortunately, I did not. And it went, then I started reading more of the those were common scams at this time. So yeah, we've, we've all been, been there. And so uh, let's see what recommendations you have for us. We had 50% and maybe even higher IRS, Social Security, there may be others too, but definitely something we need to be aware of. So we'll let, uh, I think you were gonna start us off on this, Bert, share some tips and recommendations. You bet, you bet. Uh, yes, we're seeing an uptick in, in the scams that are, are being per perpetrated. Uh, used to be the really big one was the IRS scam. It kind of mm -hmm. moved to the Social Security scam. And of course, now that we've got uh, coronavirus being an issue in our culture, uh, they've adapted. That's the thing with the scammers. They adapt very quickly to the environment that they're working in. So now you're seeing it tied back to coronavirus. You'll get uh, phishing, when they say phishing emails, that's where they're pretending to be social security or a contractor for social security. Phishing emails are the fake emails or you'll get what's probably most often is like you discussed, the phone calls uh, where they're saying, and they're, they're calling you because they're uh, saying they're from Social Security and they want to help you because your Social Security's got a problem, but they're here to help you. You know, uh, Social Security is just not going to call you on the phone. They're just really not unless you've got an ongoing issue that you've been working with. That might be an exception. And even then, be careful. Yep. Yes. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're seeing now. They, they call and they want to say, there's a problem with your social security account. Uh, you're not going to uh, be, you're not going to get your benefits, but we can fix that, you know, and they're going to start asking you information. It's one of those things where if they call you, just hang up and you turn around and make a phone call to who you know is social security. That's what I recommend the most. Anytime you're getting a phone call and they say they're the IRS or social security or whoever, you just politely hang up and then you reinitiate a phone call. Um, the IRS scammers, uh, same thing. They'll always tell you, you've got a problem, you have to fix it now. Uh, this is your last chance. Uh, I did a recording. I, I actually got on with one, and I was going to record it and use it for trainings like this. He really wasn't very good. <laughs> so I, I didn't use it. I didn't keep, and I told him at the end, he was not a good scammer. Um, but anyway, one of the points was uh, I told him my address, which was the police department, uh, and he told me where to go to buy the gift cards or the green dot cards in order to pay him so that the IRS uh, wouldn't have the sheriff come arrest me. That's another clue is they're not interested in, in traditional payment methods. They're always going to tell you now, because you've run out of time, you're going to have to do it this way. And he was so sophisticated that he told me, now you can only buy $200 worth of gift cards per store. So he directed me a block one direction to a business to get 200. And then he directed me another block to get another two. And he was telling me where I needed to go so I could get enough money so that the sheriff wouldn't arrest me. 
So again, they always come with this, you got to fix it now. It's strange payment methods, but don't even have those discussions with them. Um, talking about the size of it, uh, I was able to pull a stat last night. As of May 19th, uh, the uh, Federal Trade Commission has documented 28,400 fraud complaints in the United States. Yeah. And then, you know there are more than that. A lot of well, us don't report it then, too. Exactly. And those are all COVID related. Those aren't all the scams. Those are 28,400 COVID related fraud complaints. So they're looking at over 36 million. The average loss of people who've actually responded and lost money, the average loss is $470. Uh, just talking about frauds in general, like Virginia said, uh, statistically only 14% are reported. Uh, we find out as you lose more money, <coughs> and to be more reluctant to report it. We're all that way, we feel embarrassed. I'll tell you, every time I've done a presentation, every time I've had someone contact me and say, yeah, I lost money in a scam and they never report it, but they'll confide it to me after the presentation. Uh, surprisingly, they've determined that males are more likely than females to be victims. Yeah. <laughs> the average age is generally between 45 and 54 years of age tend to be our, our highest percentage of victims. So looking specifically here in Georgetown, I ran a stat last night. In the city of Georgetown, we've had 95 reports of criminal reports of frauds that have occurred. So if we're only getting 14%, I'm not really good at math, that's why I became a cop, but we're looking at right around 2,000 frauds per year in the city of Georgetown. We don't get that many reports, but that's likely how many people are losing money. So again, one of those things we can look at, if we're getting an email, you know, uh, be sure and look where that email's coming from. Does it make sense? Don't reply to those links. Find a way to find, you know, if it's Wells Fargo Bank, for instance, uh, then go on the Wells Fargo website and find a link to reply to. Uh, look for those things. A lot of times, these phishing emails where they send you an email are going to be from people where English is their second language. And we will find glaring mistakes in grammar that we all recognize. That's a, that's a huge red flag. So be sure and look for those. Um, the IRS imposter scam, well, and this applies to Social Security and all the others. Uh, they can mimic whatever phone number. So if you go on a website and you see that the IRS uh, complaint phone number is 1-800-whatever, or the Social Security uh, phone number for problems is 1-800-what, they can mimic that phone number. So if you get a phone number, uh, that doesn't mean you're really getting a phone number from that agency. Right. People are able to use or to create phone numbers. Um, I know if you, and I'm not throwing Google under the bus at all, but you can, there's Google phone and you can make your own phone number as long as nobody else has it. So you can create your phone number and you can actually give your phone number a name. Um, a friend of mine, she called me from her Google phone and it said uh, Cocoa Bean or, you know, cause that was her nickname, but that's what came up on my phone with a legitimate phone number. So there are ways they can call from local phone numbers. I actually got a phone call from my own phone number, which was odd. Um, you'll get a phone call from <coughs> one number off um, from your phone number, things like that. So you just have to be cognizant. If Basically, if your cell phone number or your, your contact information isn't saved in my phone, I'm not answering it. <laughs> when you talk about the Social Security scams, uh, the, the most recent statistics we have from Social Security show that from 2017 to 2018, the amount of money that was lost jumped from 210,000 to 10 million. So you can imagine by 2020, how that is exponentially jumped up. So the problem's huge. I will say that the uh, Office of Investigator General uh, for Social Security, if you get on the internet, Social Security Administration, Office of Investigator General, they've got a wonderful website where you can report these scams. You just click on there and you start loading the information. 
uh, just make sure you're on the Social Security website. One of the things you always do is check for that little uh, padlock uh, symbol that's up there where you type the www. That helps you uh, know you're on a, a good website. But anyway, they've got a, a great website uh, on there. Uh, real quickly about some of the other scams that aren't coronavirus related, but they're still out there. Uh, the romance scam is, is one. Uh, I knew about it, didn't see one for years, but yes, they've started popping up in Georgetown. And this is basically where someone creates a online relationship with you and things are going well, and these will stretch over months and months. And in the end, after you've established this friendship, then all of a sudden there are reasons that they're short of money and need help. And often these, these are going into the thousands of dollars. Uh, one of the ones that was the first one here was a, a, a lady who developed a friendship. The guy said, I'm an off field, uh, I'm offshore oil field worker. You know, and he just talked about, yeah, I'm going to retire sometime. This went on for months. And then I actually, since I've got to know you, Georgetown sounds interesting. I'm going to come to Georgetown and look for houses. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden he got sick, supposedly. And all of a sudden he had to be transported off of this oil field flat, platform into Mexico for medical treatment. And he needed all this money just so he could get back to the United States. Uh, anyway, we have other examples. And frankly, the ones that we do hear about are often reported by the adult children. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's the important thing. Uh, we may not fall victim as a person if you're out there, but you probably know someone that's at risk of falling victim. So that's why it's so important to keep touch with the community around you and, and what's going on. And these are happening a lot more often right now because people are alone in their homes and they're feeling lonely and they want some sort of connection and they kind of have that social thing happening right now. And so we're starting to see that a little bit more often. Um, so which is why we're, we're kind of touching on it. But even though you're feeling lonely at home, sometimes it may not be best to get online to find that perfect mate, right? <laughs> I got two others I got to talk about real quick. Uh, of course, we all know about the grandchild scam. And I can't tell you how many people have gotten those calls. And some of them are great. They're wonderfully convincing. Uh, the one I like is the guy who says he's the attorney for your grandson. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they're always grandson's in trouble, uh, needs a little bit of money uh, so he can get out of legal trouble. He really didn't do anything wrong. He was just with the wrong people at the wrong time. You know, lots of money going out the door for those things. The other one I got to tell you about, and I want to emphasize how just the scammers can seize on the very little things. Had a uh, older gentleman, World War II vet, you know how we have those, those caps and it may have uh, what unit we were in. Uh, this particular gentleman was on a ship in the Navy and he had it on the hat. Woman confronts him in the store and says, ah, I don't remember your name, but uh, I was with my father over at the VA clinic when we met you, he served on board with you. Well, she knew the name of the ship from his hat and she, she throws out a name. And of course, we don't want to feel bad like I have no idea who you're talking about. So you always pretend, oh, okay. Even though you may not remember them, you pretend you remember them. And so that's what he did. And she went on to say, he thought so much of you. And I was so honored uh, that I got to meet you and it was great. You know, he recently passed away. And the story went on to be, he left me a couple of rent houses. It's going to destroy my tax situation if I keep both rent houses. So since he thought so much of you, I want to sell one of those houses to you really cheap. And she went on to execute uh, this sale. Uh, he paid money down. Uh, before he did that, she was good. He got in the vehicle with her and he rode by a house. And she said, that's the house. We can't stop and go in because it's, it's already leased to a family and they don't know they're about to be told they have to move out. I have to let the leasing company do that. So she had a logical story for why they couldn't go in the house. And of course it was a really good deal. So uh, he took her up on it. So that's, that's how they can take the smallest little information that they have right about you 
and they can extrapolate it out and convince you, yeah, I really know you, uh, and, and they can work, work their magic, so to speak. So be real so, careful. Uh, with Lord, that. I just had uh, Jeff, who may want to unmute himself, is telling me that Verizon has an app that identifies possible scam callers. Do you know anything about that, Bert or Delta? Or yes, I've seen some of that. Have you been associated? Yeah. So with on my on my phone, um, I I don't have Verizon. Um, I have another provider, but um, it's it'll give you uh, it'll say possible scam, and it'll come up with some mm -hmm. sort of notification. Um, and one of uh, any phone numbers that have been identified as scam will say verified scam on there. So I just don't answer those phone calls. Like I said. Um, if it's not saved in my phone, if it's important enough, you'll leave me a message. <laughs> uh, if not, I won't be answering the phone. I was curious how they get those numbers because I'm with T-Mobile and I get those and so I don't answer them. There have been a few times I clicked by mistake. Some of them were legitimate calls, but yeah, I figure if it is, they're going to leave me a message. But yeah, so there, those, there are things to help us out there. Yes, yeah, um, great technology. Okay. Uh, one other thing I wanted to uh, kind of pick up on, uh, I wanted to see if we could insert this short video here. Oh, I'm right. going to click on it. This is about a, a, a new credit card uh, scam. Well, it's, it's where they electronically can get your credit card number. We'll talk about it. Here we go. It's electronic pickpocketing. That's really what it is. Wow. It could just be the scariest high-tech crime out there. They call it pocket surfing, electronic pickpocketing. Try to imagine a credit card thief who could steal your credit card numbers, all of them at the very same time, just by walking by you. Thieves stealing your credit card number right out of thin air. Let me see your information and it's coming back to you. Chris Gilbert is a security expert with the National Crime Stop Program, who says the same technology that allows you to wave your credit card in front of a scanner at the store is now allowing thieves to steal your credit card numbers. All they have to do is buy a scanner and a boost of power. There is no contact required by the criminal and you, your card can be in your wallet or your purse. All of which means if your credit or debit card is chipped, in other words, has an RFID computer chip inside, like this one, and suddenly a credit card thief walks by with one of those scanners in his backpack, well then, it's just the same as if you had your name, your credit card number, and the expiration date printed right on your check. I mean, they could pretty much ruin your life. Is someone taking your identity and stealing it and losing everything? People we talked to couldn't believe it, but we proved it at a Houston mall. In 15 minutes, Chris Gilpin was able to capture the credit card numbers of 39 people. And the numbers are right there. So how do you keep this crime from happening? Chris has developed a brand new product called the Signal Ball. When you place this card in your wallet, it forms an electronic shield around all your credit cards. We tested it out. Without the protective shield, the machine will be. But with it, so I take the signal ball, put it in my wallet. Now, nothing. Just like a bulletproof vest for your wallet. Now, we want to make it clear we destroyed all information collected with this credit card scanner. It is just a test to make a point. Okay. So, again, these are the RFID. Uh, I've got Delta's credit card. You see the little symbol. Uh, that's that's important. That tells you if it's one of those types of calls. Again, that particular video, he's selling his particular product. There are a lot of products out on the market. You can get individual wallets for men, or you can get women's wallets, or women can get entire purses that are RFID shielded. Ah, there you go. So it's an important thing. Uh, just Look at your credit cards, see if those symbols are on there. And if they are, know that you, you need to have that extra protection. I've just steered away from them. I don't have any credit cards that have that on there. Uh, but it's certainly easy to lose that information. Also, a lot of those credit cards are by default now. So when you get your uh, debit or credit card from your bank, um, I would also check those. You can also request a card that does not have RFI, uh, okay. RFID chip on there. So you can yeah. request those. Let me, uh, so what did you call it? RFI? What did you call R it? Yes, RFID. Okay, so if it's the little, looks like the little radiating out. Yes. Yes. That's one that would be susceptible. Yes, Correct. that's it. 
You're that's exactly it. right. You have one. Oh, we're lucky. Yeah. You can request credit cards without that. Correct. Is that yeah. the same as chip when you know no, that, no. that's the that's chip not... is different. The okay. chip is a security feature. Uh that's the, the thing that's on the front of the card yeah. that uh has the design on it. Let me see if I can get one. Ah, ah there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's there's the chip, the little gold. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's entirely different. Entirely different. But RFI. Okay. R RFID. So just and that just allows the card to pass near a receiver and and it pays for your product. Right. But it also allows anyone who can boost one of those receivers to be able to grab your card information. Yeah. Wow. And so my card has both the chip and RFID. I don't do the wavy wavy. I got, you can actually call and have it deactivated. But again, it's probably just safer to request a card from your bank that does not have that on there. Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it automatically, everyone always asks, well, what I, what I do about checking my credit? Uh, two great websites. Okay. First one, annualcreditreport.com. It's all one word, annualcreditreport.com. That is a safe website. That is uh, the three major credit reporting agencies have banded together to make it simpler for us to check our credit. You are allowed one free credit report per year per company. So uh, for instance, one of our detectives he has it set up where every three months, he, uh, I'm sorry, every four months, he requests a, a credit report on himself from a company. So you've got three major companies. So every four months, he's getting a report from a different company uh, for himself. So he gets one continuously. Now, he also does that for his wife, and he also does that for his minor children. Yep. Yes, we are finding six-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and 12-year-olds with bad credit. Yeah, because they, they just need a name. Uh, so if you've got uh, grandchildren and, and maybe, maybe you find out your adult children uh, have been scammed and their credits got all messed up, have them check their kids because mm -hmm. it may be affecting their kids too and you won't know it until you start trying to apply for those college yeah. loans. Wow. Yeah, so annualcreditreport.com, great website. Uh, they will walk you through the process. One of the things they'll do is once you start to load on there and request it, they will ask you a lot of specific questions because they're wanting to make sure it's you. Uh, I, I'm trying to think, they asked me an address that I lived at like 30 years ago uh, was one of the confirmation questions. So it's not, it's not real easy and you might have some of your financial records nearby you, not not dollar amounts, but you know old old records, so you can help verify you are who you are. Uh, another great website, it's uh, the Federal Trade Commission. So it's www.ftc, is in Frank Tom Charles, ftc.com. I'm sorry, dot gov. Thank you, ftc.gov. Um, it's one of those things we always say, I'm, I'm here from the government, I'm here to help you. They've done a really great job with this website. If your credit gets messed up, you can start on this web page and it will move you to a web page and it will walk you step by step on how to repair your credit. When they say, hey, you need to contact uh, the business where your credit was improperly used, it will give you an example of what your letter should say. And you literally have to plug your name, your address, and the amount that was improperly taken from you in the letter, and then you ship it to that company. And it will, will tell you, hey, you need to file a police report and get a submit a copy of this letter with the police report and all of those kinds. So it will step-by-step step walk you through the steps. Just a great website. There's also a lot of other resources on there. Also, uh, they have where they advertise about different scams that are going on. You can report scams that are going on, which brings us back to what do we report to the police and what do we not report? 
uh, it's interesting to us what's happening out in the community. Uh, so we like to hear about that, but we generally won't take an actual criminal report unless you've lost money. Now, if you're actually scammed the money and it goes away out of your account and you're in the process of trying to get it recovered, yeah, we'll take a report on that. But if you get a, a phone call or you get a, a phishing email from someone, uh, that's interesting for Delta and I's unit to know about, but we're not gonna take a criminal report on that if you didn't lose any money, if you caught it in time and didn't lose money. Uh, but this website likes to know also, and that's one of the things we look at because we can see the trends on the different scams. So again, great website, ftc.gov and annualcreditreport.com. Okay, you've given us lots of valuable information. I do want to open it up for questions. Uh, I know Mary Tramborn has a question. Can you call on her, Jeff? Okay. Okay, there I'm back. All right, good. So, Mary, what was your question? Uh, what can you do when you, I mean, I have poor mobility. I have a walk with a cane. I am aware of my surroundings. I moved from Houston, so I'm aware of all this. What else can I do to be safe? <laughs> well, uh, one thing I would recommend with those, um, with the parameters that you've given, I would make sure, I, not going to lie to you, I carry a fanny pack now. Um, so I would recommend making sure that you have your, the ability to uh, get to your cell phone. If you get, um, if you, you're having mobility problems, I carry my, uh, when I'm out with my daughter and I'm not working, um, I actually carry a fanny pack with all of my stuff in there. So it's on the front of me. I got everything secured to me. So they have to really do some damage to try to get me or my stuff. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you're, I mean, especially being in Houston, uh, you have to be aware of your surroundings. Um, that's kind well, of- Well, I'm in Sun City now. I moved from Houston. Right, right. But from being, when, when you were there, it, it's a little bit more of a, it's less of an aha moment there in Houston to be aware of your surroundings rather than it is here. Um, so I, I think with that uh, background, I think you might be solid. I want to say thank you very much. Okay, Mary? Uh, you yeah. mentioned you live in Sun City, and I won't have the exact reference, but we but somebody can help us out. Uh, last year, I had hip revision surgery, so I was on a cane for a few months, and I was at Walgreens one day with, on my cane, and a gentleman turned around to me and started talking to me about using my cane as self-protection. Delta mentioned that briefly, and I think in Sun City, when well, we live there too, but I'm not familiar, and somebody can maybe help us that there was some kind of a class or a resource that they really helped people know how to use their canes as, for self-defense. I don't know if anybody, if anyone has more specifics about that, if you raise your hand or we'll try to find well, out about that. Well, I did take the self-defense course that was offered eh, maybe about a year ago. It was a six week course. It was more of a Tai Chi thing, uh -huh. but he taught how to use the cane. Oh. And I did know that there is a self-defense club here in Sun City, which I've not taken part of, but I know friends that have had it to, to, to do it. Okay. So, so Mary, or if I've got, one of the great things I'll say about Sun City is we go out to Sun City and Sun City does the best job of taking care of each other. Yeah. We'll <laughs> ring a doorbell and a neighbor will come out and say, hey, can I help you? Mm -hmm. And literally I've had them go, it's Tuesday, yeah. they're at Bocce Ball or whatever. Yeah. And that's just, and we don't see that everywhere in our community. So one of the best things you've done, of course, is get out of Houston. I love it, but yes. <laughs> but Sun City is a great place to be. When I left Houston. <laughs> right. But I love the sense of community that y'all maintain out there. And I think that's a huge piece. Okay. Thank you very much. And I need to leave. I need to go to the dentist, but thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for being with us, Mary. Other questions that people have, if you'll just indicate, Catherine Rice has a question. Let's see. Okay. Catherine. There, can you hear me now? Yes, I think, yes. Okay. I don't know if this is uh, something for everyone, but what I did when my 
husband passed away and I've done it for myself this year, I put a permanent freeze on my credit with the three major credit reporting agencies. Uh, it's free, you can do it on the phone. You have, they give you a pin, a, a letter to verify with a pin number on it because you can't uh, apply for a credit card unless you reopen and unfreeze your credit. But it's, for me, it was a safety thing that no one could get a, ca a card in my name. A oh, great tool. Thank you for bringing that up. So, so much of the time when I talk to younger people, that's just not an option because they're still building credit and they're, you know, uh, you can go, uh, go to a particular furniture store and if you get their credit card, you get so much off the purchase and all. So it's just not an option for a lot of younger people uh, very easily. But yeah, it's a great option. Love it. Thanks for sharing, Catherine. Al Peters has a question or comment. Can we hear you, Al? Let's see. There, Al. Look. I believe Al is still muted. That's what we're trying to unmute him. I clicked on it. He's muted on his end. Al, can, I, yeah, I think we've unmuted you. Can you click on your little microphone where it says mute or unmute? I don't think his hand is raised. Okay, maybe not. It, well, his name is up there, though. Is, okay, uh, let's see. Um, Anne, did you, our names are coming up here, so I didn't know, maybe not though. I guess those are not raised hands. Anyone, let's go for any more raised hands. I think these may be now showing up as participants or attendees. Any other questions that people can think of? Catherine Rice. We call on Catherine. She, yeah. I just yeah, my, my mute button's just flash, flashing back and forth, sorry. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for uh, people being with us today. And Delta and Bert, thank you so much for all the resources and just awareness that you've shared. I mean, it's easy for us to think, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. But then we've seen those situations where you can be followed home or things can happen or we get careless and leave doors open. So. We do live in, live in a safe environment and we have great services to protect us, but we have to do our part too. So we thank you all for taking time to be with us today and look forward to sharing the resources you've provided. We'll be getting those out in email uh, tomorrow to people. So thank okay. you for that. Um, our next session, I look, I look forward to seeing people here in June when we will have our session on From We to Me. There we go, so you'll see it. Um, we to Me, when you find yourself making all the decisions, it will be, uh, there we go, June 18th. Registration will be open up tomorrow, maybe even today online. You can register at the Seniors Living Smarter uh, website backslash seminar. You can go on there and register, or you can call the number uh, and leave a message, and we'll get you registered and follow up with you. I know for some people, we said the Zoom messages that you get when you register to confirm registration and tell you it's been a, a week and a month. Some of those messages are kind of confusing with lots of extra phone numbers and all. <coughs> Excuse me. So I made my own, and I'll be sending to you also but we wanna make it as easy as we can for people to join us for their webinars. Um, I know we missed the interaction. We're looking at having some other kinds of casual conversation coffees. We did, we've had a couple, we did one. Um, first one we did, there were about 13 people who joined us when we said like, reconnecting and just an update on the market. And we did one following the last webinar when we had um, talked about how to pay for long-term care and so we had some people there. Those we do as meetings, so we see each other and have a little bit more interaction. But um, as, al as always, we're here to serve you. Uh, I know that this time that we're going through has caused a lot of 
people, our seniors, lots of families to think about future plans. Well, where, where should I really be? Who do I want to be close to? Um, what, what might simplify some people? Oh, I couldn't be confined to an apartment in an independent living community for this period of time, but yet everything is provided for you there. So they're always give and takes. But if you're needing, if you want to think about some possible plans for the future, we're here to help you. Um, sharing resources, just to be, think through what be good steps for you and how can we simplify things. So as always, we want you to continue being our uh, seniors living smarter and feel free to reach out any questions we can answer for you. And I'll see you in June. Thanks so much and have a great day.